Chapter 7 of Molly of the Movies by Kenneth McGaffey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Seventh Reel. September 15, 1915. Clarabelle. I got a darn good notion to leave the silent drama flat and come back home. Not that I ain't popular in my art, because I have already worked two days this week, and it is only Saturday now. But I am so homesick that pie hasn't tasted the same to me since Tuesday. I have been out to the Selig Zoo, working in the chronicles of Bloomer Center. The set reminded me so of Grundy Center, on a busy day, that I sat right down and cried, regardless of makeup. I was a-setting there sobbing all over the map, when Mr. Persons comes up and says to me, he says, After you get through with this picture, let me know, and I will put you to work with the cats. I told Bessie Eiton what he said, and how I loved the kittens. She said, Huh, he must be trying to cut down his meat bill. Deary, I learn that them cats and Mr. Persons is a flock of raging lions. I have often said that animals ain't what you might call legitimate actors, and up to now I have refused to work with them, because I never have been in a studio where there was any, and I had never been asked. But if Kathleen Williams can do it, I guess I can. I asked Mr. Ralph McComas about them, and he said all you have to do is to look them right in the eye, and they ache with fear. He said the human eye had wonderful influenza on a lion and he had known them to lay down and die just from being looked at. He advised me not to look too hard, or I might kill them all off. He said I should put dimmers on my lamps, so as to take no chances. You know, dear, all of the traveling gentlemen that stopped in Grundy Center said I had beautiful eyes, so if them lions get fresh with me, I'll curl them up with a glance. Remember how I withered that shoe drummer that said he knew I was a country belle because I looked like a string bean? Some wither. I ain't keen about this Bloomer Center stuff, it is nice for fine work and all that, but I have to wear my own clothes when I crave to be dolled up like a queen in a book in purple and vermine. I am not the girl to brag about myself, Clarabelle, but when I am garbaged in silks and satins, with one of these here Queen Elizabeth ruffs and a heavy veil, I am a nifty looker. You know that newspaper friend of mine, the sporting editor of the Beekeeper's Annual? He's just the loveliest man. So attentive. Twice already he has called up this week to know if I had been at by them animals. Said he didn't want to get scooped or something like that. He has given me the grandest presents, two copies of the annual, so I can read the words he has penned. He is a very talented writer, he told me, and could turn out lots better stories than this guy Chambers, or London, or Dickens. That is, if he could only think of them. He admitted that. In a burst of confidence the other night, he said that a lot of the magazines were sore at him because he wouldn't quit the beekeepers and go to work for them. He showed me a lot of slips from the magazines, rejecting his stuff to prove it. He wears his hair long, and a turned-down collar, and a Windsor tie. So he must be a genius. His name is Cuthbert de Vignette. Ain't that gosh hanged romantic? And I've got his picture hanging up over the crack in the mirror. He said that a writer could bear his heart on enduring paper that would live through ages, but that some soused machine operator with a lighted cigarette could blow up a whole building with some screen artist's life work. He told me that a woman with my depth and my soul and my brain should be a wonderful inspired writer, and to give me a start, he is going to let me, under his guidance, address circulars down in his office. It will be a doggone sight better for me to sway the world with my pen for years to come than to hand a Monday matinee audience a giggle with twenty feet of comedy fall down a flight of steps. The man casts a spell over me, dearie, and I feel myself sort of fading out on the photodrama. I hear his feet step now. I must fly to him. Love, Molly. September 25th 1915. Dear Clarabelle, I just had a session with them lions, and I am plumb beat out. If I ever get a hold of that McComas person that told me that animals quaked before the human eye, he won't even be a speck on the lens. Clarabelle, don't you believe that a lion gives a hang about the human eye? It's the human limb that beast is interested in. After I finished with the what you call it of Bloomer Center, I, like a boob, let Mr. Persons, at Seelig's, give me that job with the cats he was talking about. The most vicious lion on the place it was, and according to the script, I was supposed to be the lion's little playmate, a child of the jungle, it said. Some fresh assistant director handed me a welcome mat to wear for a skin robe, shoved me in behind a cage door, and said, go on, be a child of nature. My dear, I looked around and there was a lion the size of an elephant. I looked him right in the eye, but he wouldn't look at me, but kept coming right along. I looked at him until I doggone near strained my eyes and then I made a dash for the side fence, and clumb right up the wires to the top, and when there, believe me, I called for assistance in no uncertain manner. 
The trainer hollered and said, What are you trying to do, scare the lion to death? And I says, Well, it's fifty-fifty. And they took me out. I think I'm cut out for a homebody anyway. And if Cuthbert just gives me a chance, I will grab him and abandon my professional career. I feel I could be a second Laura Eugene Libby if I had the right dope. Love, Molly. End of chapter 7